you, Tanya, and Children's Church, and everybody who was there, Charles and Sue. Um, I have never heard that song to Jingle Bells. Is that your first time? Raise your hand. I didn't know there was such a thing. Praise the Lord that we have that. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me invite you to turn to Luke chapter 4, if you would. We're continuing in our uh, study of the Gospel of Luke verse by verse. And we today are going to look at the fundamentals of Christian ministry. The fundamentals of Christian ministry. You know, every good coach knows the importance of the fundamentals. You know, I, I recently had a conversation with an assistant basketball coach about, you know, their, their winning or losing record. And uh, we talked about fundamentals. We talked about attitude. We talked about leadership. Last night, my kids and I were watching a ball game where um, free throws could have determined that, that that game did not go into overtime, okay? Fundamentals. Making of a free throw would have won the game. It wouldn't have gone into overtime. Fortunately, in the overtime, our team won, or at least the team that we were voting for. So, you know, just a, a, an improvement in the fundamentals, 3 to 5% improvement in the fundamentals, that team would have won without having to go into overtime. You know, whatever sport it is, in basketball, you know, the fundamentals, shooting, free throws, screening, passing, uh, boxing out, rebounding, fundamentals. In football, blocking, running, passing, receiving, the fundamentals. In uh, soccer, the same thing, ball handling, passing, scoring, fundamentals. In golf, you know, <laughs> the swing, you know, everything's revealed in the flight of the ball. Okay, the ball goes this way, the swing's bad this way, if the ball goes that way, you know, everything's revealed in the fundamentals. So we're going to look at today the fundamentals of Christian ministry. We're going to look through Jesus' uh, ministry of healing and other, other types of ministry, but we'll see that it's made up of four key elements which can be applied to Christian ministry. So the fundamentals of Christian ministry would include the authoritative teaching of the Word of God, the confrontation of evil, exercising compassion, and having personal renewal. So let's go ahead and look at Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 31. Now remember, this is on the heels of Jesus getting essentially kicked out of the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. He passes through the crowd as they took him to throw him off the cliff. And now he's, he's, he's descended from the hill country down to, to the lower elevation of Galilee, or, or, the, or the, the town of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. So let's follow along as I read Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And the devil had thrown him in the midst he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. So here we have the, uh, a demonstration of the fundamentals of Christian ministry here the fundamentals of his healing ministry, we have, he, he's coming down to Capernaum. From the hill countries of Nazareth, now down to, to the lower elevation of, of, the, of the seaside town of Capernaum. Capernaum is about 15 to 20 miles away from his hometown of Nazareth. It was a, quote, north shore, a, 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 a trade city, a fishing city, a fishing town, as was read in the parallel passage during the scripture reading. This is the place where Peter, Andrew, James, and John were partners, and they had a business there off, the, off of um, the Sea of Galilee there in Capernaum. It was a mixture of people, and as you can imagine, uh, there was also uh, Roman headquarters stationed there. 
So there was traffic going to and from because of trade routes, because of the military. And so this was a happening place, which means there was a mixture of people and it had many lines of communication because of all the trade routes going. This was an ideal place to get his message across so it would go all across the known world, that geographical area there. So he could have a great impact there, and thus Jesus made Capernaum the base of operations in his northern ministry, in the Galilean ministry. And it says there in the text uh, on verse 41, and he taught them on the Sabbath days. So it was just more than one occasion. So it was a regular practice, it seems here, that he taught them in that synagogue there in Capernaum. And uh, they were, as it says there, astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. So the word power, the Greek word exousia, that means uh, authority, uh, inherent authority here. This is, uh, he, he, he taught with liberty and with force. And according to Mark chapter 1 there, the parallel passage, Mark 1, it says in this way, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he had taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. So the people were used to hearing the, the, the rabbinic teachers, the, the teachers in the synagogue saying, Rabbi so-and-so says this. Rabbi what's-his-name says this. And they would bolster their argument or their, their teaching by quoting other rabbis and by quoting what, uh, was be, what was becoming a running commentary, the Talmud. They would quote other rabbis, quoting other rabbis, quoting other rabbis. But Jesus was different. Jesus, it says there, they were astonished at his doctrine. Jesus did not quote Rabbi so-and-so. Jesus did not build upon the traditions of men. Jesus spoke, read, taught directly from the Word of God. He appealed directly to the text, and he explained the text. He did not quote anybody else. His, his authority was inherent. It was in himself and in the Old Testament Scriptures itself. People had never heard such teaching so that they were amazed. And, you know, surprisingly, there's a confrontation in the place of worship. There is a man possessed by a demon. After hearing the authority, authoritative teaching of the Word of God, after seeing the response of the people, all of a sudden this interjection, this shriek, this howl, in verse 33, we see it. Let me read it to you again. It says, And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee or thou, Jesus of Nazareth? Are thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. So here we see de uh, a confrontation as Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. And the acknowledgement of the, de the demon here, he, he recognizes who Jesus is. But the text says that he is an unclean spirit. The word unclean is often used to describe uh, evil spirits. It means that they themselves are impure, and they themselves produce impurity in the lives of the victims in whom they possess. We know that they are ruled by Satan. We know that demons work to tempt people to sin, to oppose God. We know that sometimes they can cause a person to become deaf, mute, blind, or insane. That is not always the case with physical, physical disease. We also know that the demons are fallen angels, one of the one-third of angels which joined Satan in the rebellion against God. And we know here that this evil spirit had entered into this man's body taken up residence and controlled him, controlled his mind and controlled his speech. And it's interesting to note that during the three years of Jesus' public ministry that demons were allowed to flourish. And I believe one of the reasons was they were allowed to be very active in order to show that Christ had authority over them, that Jesus came who would have authority over Satan and his minions. And it's interesting to note also that this demon knows who he is. If you look back at the text, it says, I know who thou art, thou Jesus of Nazareth. The Jews had believed that the Messiah would come to crush Satan and his minions. 
Okay, that was supported by the text of the Old Testament. Okay, even the first promise of salvation in the Savior delivered, Genesis 3.15. Okay, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. From that very first book of the Bible, we see that this, this war will go on and who the victor will be. It will be the Messiah. So Luke informs us here that this demon recognizes Jesus as Messiah. And this demon acknowledges two things. I know you're Jesus from Nazareth. Okay, you're Jesus from Nazareth, and you're the Messiah. That's one. You're Jesus from Nazareth. You can destroy us. You will destroy us. You're the Holy One of God. So here, the title Holy One of God speaks of uh, set-apartness. You are the Holy One of God, set apart for God's purpose and use. You are set apart. If you read uh, the Apostle John's description of how Jesus was going to come as Messiah, this is what it says in, in, uh, in 1 John 3, 8, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So here, here's an acknowledgement of this demon knowing who, who Jesus is. Now, if you can get this picture here, here's the embodiment of evil and uncleanness in this demon-possessed man. And here is the embodiment of God in the flesh. At war, at the least likeliest of places, a place of worship. It was no contest. Okay, some believe that uh, this demon, this demon in cultural thought is this, is that if you knew a person's name, you can control them. You had some type of influence or power over them. And some believe that's why Jesus shut them up, told them to be silent. We know in Revelation 20, verse 10, that Satan and his demons will be tormented. They'll be tossed into the lake of fire forever. So they will be destroyed. So he was accurate, this demon. Jesus is of Nazareth. Jesus is... Messiah, Jesus is the Holy One of God who would come to destroy us, the demons. He was accurate, but Jesus shuts him up anyway. He knew the identity of the Messiah. He knew who Jesus is and was then. And you know, the Lord's brother James in James chapter 2 verse 19 says it, right? The demons also believe that there's one God. And they tremble. People have difficulty accepting the identity of who Jesus is. The demons do not. They know exactly who he is. But Jesus commands him here in verse 35, Hold thy peace and come out of him. Hold thy peace. Literally, be muzzled. In today's language, shut up. Shut your mouth. Jesus wants nothing to do with a demonic confession in a public place. But that wasn't the end of it. Okay, it, was, it wasn't enough that he closed the mouth of the demon, yet he also had to deliver the man. Be muzzled, hold thy peace, come out. And again, Jesus commanded that the demon come out and the demon obeyed. No contest, again, in this spiritual warfare. Jesus speaks and it's done. Other teachers of that day would bemoan the fact of, oh, evil is rising. There's many more and more demon possessions. In fact, if you just Google that, there is more and more these days. But he didn't just complain about evil or demonic influence. He put evil in its place. He had authority over them. And the crowd is amazed again. They don't understand it. They haven't seen it before. This was not a common thing in that day. It's not a common thing now. But they were amazed at his authority. He was able to cast out this demon with a word. There was no, you know, uh, incantation, no hocus pocus, no abracadabra. He spoke and it was done. His word was enough to fight against the demonic realm. And again, they respond with amazement, not only at his teaching, but at his authority over the demonic forces. So we ask the question, why would Jesus want the demons to be silent? He will do this over and over again. He will tell the demons to basically close their mouths. 
One of the reasons, I think, is because, you know, if you knew somebody's name, you had some type of influence or control over them. I think one of the other reasons is he didn't want the demons to inflame the people about a political messiah, a political messiah who would come and rise up against Roman oppression and cast out the Romans out of Israel and make Israel great again. He didn't want that. The timing was not right. He came to free people from their sin, not from their government. So let's look at verse 38 now, after this visit in the synagogue. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And if you remember during the scripture reading, Simon is Simon Peter, okay? Simon Peter's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and ministered unto them. So here we see him making a home visit. He heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. She's immediately cured um, at this home visit. It's interesting, Luke doesn't mention at all about um, his meeting of the disciples. He's been ministering for perhaps a year already. Okay, One of the reasons I think he doesn't mention it is because it's already been written in Matthew and Mark. And so we learn from the Gospel of John that he has chosen these guys to come with him, or at least invited them to come with him. And he hasn't essentially chosen them as apostles just yet, but he will. But here he's at Peter's house, and she, is, she has a great fever. The word fever there, means, the literal word means inflamed. She had a burning hot fever. And typically, Back in those days, you either recovered quickly or you died from it. But here, Jesus heals her. He rebukes the fever. It leaves her, and immediately she rises up. Okay, This wasn't uh, just like a, a slow-going, natural healing. Typically, to recover from a fever, it takes a little bit of time. Here, it's instantaneous. She gets up, and she begins to serve the people in her house again. <clears throat> he exercised his authority over disease here. And even after the synagogue service, you know, news spread like wildfire. Amazing. Listen to this this rabbi, this teacher who has rebuked the demons. And now perhaps after this lunchtime meal, after the home synagogue meal, coming home from synagogue, the news has gone out again. He is healed from diseases. They know where he's at. The townsfolk and the people around the surrounding towns, they're starting to bring in their sick and they're demon-possessed. And again, this is unheard of. Not only is he's got authoritative teaching, he has authority over demons, now he has authority over disease. And I think Luke intentionally puts this pair of miracles right next to each other, if you think about it through this way. Here's the Son of God, the Holy One of God, the one that is set apart for God, and he's already declared what he came to do. Remember last week when he read Isaiah to set the captives free, to heal the brokenhearted, to release the oppressed. He has come to do that, and he's doing it. It's happening here before their eyes. But we see here, I think Luke pairs these two miracles, the personification of evil in the demon-possessed man and the, the healing of personal suffering. What we have here, I think, is a visual demonstration with a deeper reality. And the reality is this. Jesus is the Son of God and has authority over everything. Death, disease, demons, everything. And this is what Luke is communicating here as he lays these stories side by side. He is God and he has authority over all. Now let's look at verses 40 and 41 here. As we see him move from this busy day of ministry, he heals his mo- uh, Peter's mother-in-law, and we're in verse 40. And when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. 
Now to understand verse 40, now when the sun was setting, the Jews, the religious leaders, had created laws and traditions where, look, you can't walk a certain distance, you can't do this amount of work, you can't carry anything during Sabbath. From sunset to sunset, Friday evening to Saturday evening of the Sabbath, no work. You can only walk a certain distance. You can only do a certain amount of work, light, light duty stuff. So they waited. Okay, those, with the, those who had sick loved ones who would carry them on, uh, on, on stretchers or wagons or whatever they had, they waited until the sun set so it was no longer Sabbath, and they bring all these sick and, and some demon-possessed people for the healing that Jesus could give. So Sabbath is over, and if you can imagine, Jesus could have just said this as the crowd outside of the home stretches forth his hands, be healed. He could have done that, and they would have, you know, the diseases and the demons would have obeyed him because he had that authority, but he did not do that. Excuse me, that's my phone. Please turn off your phones. <laughs> that was an alarm. Hopefully that doesn't go off again. <laughs> All right. Um, so at Sabbath, right? <laughs> at the sunset. All these people, all these needs, so great a need. And no doubt Jesus is tired from a day of teaching, a day of confrontation with evil, a day of healing. He is human. He has a body. He has human flesh. And all these folks are coming for healing. And it says here, he laid hands on them. You know, we can't do healings unless, unless you have something special. We can't heal like Jesus healed. We can't cast out demons. We can't cast out disease. Here we have Jesus coming out and laying hands on them. In the laying out of hands, there's history behind this. In Genesis, Jacob laid his hands on his grandsons to bless them. So the laying out of hands was given to confer blessing on people. Or Moses laid hands on those who would take leadership to confer, uh, to delegate authority and establish the leadership publicly. And here I think Jesus had authority to confer blessing and healing. And he does. He ministered to them individually out of love. Jesus healed them. And he treated them as individuals, not numbers. We can't heal people, but we can treat people as individuals. We can exercise compassion on individuals. We can love individuals who are in need. That's something we can do individually. We can be the hands of Jesus on this earth and the heart of Jesus pouring love to those in need. And we see here that the demons again cry out, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, and he shuts them up again. They have to be silenced. He's not going to accept demonic confession in a public forum. The Apostle Paul would do the same thing in the book of Acts. And look what happens here in verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. This is after the healing. This is early the next morning. And it says, And the people sought him, in verse 42, and came unto him and stayed him, that he should not depart from them. So after a long day of ministry, after a long evening of ministry, the next morning Jesus rises up a great while before day. Okay, the parallel passage that was read during the scripture reading, he, he rose up to spend time with God. He prayed. He got away from ministry, from the busyness, from the craziness, from, from, from the weight, the heaviness of ministry. And they found him and they say, stay. 
Okay? They stayed him. They wanted, pre- they wanted to prevent him from leaving. Yet Jesus doesn't take his directions from the crowd. Jesus' ministry is not dependent on the needs of the people. Okay, we'll see that Jesus gives his mission statement in just a minute. We'll also see Luke gives us a summary statement of what he does in this northern region. Look at verse 43. After they tried to get him to to stay and not leave them, he says in verse 43, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. So we have the mission statement, I must preach the kingdom of God. And then we have a summary statement, 240 towns in the region of Galilee, and Luke just summarizes it here. He preached from synagogue to synagogue, because that's why he was sent, to preach the kingdom of God. So these people had unending needs. Jesus healed them, then he went to a place of solitude and seclusion. And the reason is because he was human. The reason is, you and I, we also have, I'm sorry again, I got to turn this off. The reason is he has a human body like us. He needs to get away. He needs to get mentally, emotionally, physically renewed. He needed rest. He needed relaxation. He needed to be renewed with his fellowship with God. Solitude and prayer. No single town, no single city had any priority over Jesus' ministry. He had to do the will of God, and the will of God was him to preach the gospel. You know, we are not only called to train our children, to train and win our family and influence those in our family, but we're also called to influence those around us, and we cannot do it if we're worn out. We cannot do it if our bodies are sick because we don't rest, because we don't renew, because we don't spend solitude with God, being refreshed and renewed in prayer and solitude. He says here, listen, after he goes and spends time in prayer with God early in the morning, he says, look, I must preach the kingdom of God. That's central in his ministry. Healing is important, yes, but the gospel is more important. Healing ministers to the body, the gospel ministers to the soul forever. So that's his primary purpose, to preach the gospel, the kingdom of God. And by by preaching the kingdom of God, he himself was the king. He came to reign over them, but they have to first repent. He cannot reign over people who will not let go of their sin. If you cling to your sin and don't repent from them, he can't be your savior. So repent and believe is his message. They must first repent. For many, the obstacle was they wanted to be saved from their political problems, not from their personal sin. But his miracles proved that his messiahship and his message were to save souls. That's what it was aiming towards. His mission statement, again, is, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom. And so must we. You and I, we must. It's not, a, a, it's not an exception. It, it's not an alternative. It is a necessity. It's an essential. We must preach the kingdom of God. So as I close here, think about this. The fundamentals of ministry here. Are you practic- practicing the fundamentals of Christian ministry? What we saw first was Jesus' ministry was authoritative teaching. Do you... Do you you know it? Have you learned it? Do you love it? Have you lived it? Could you teach it? Authoritative word from God. That's fundamental in Christian ministry. That's fundamental in our Christian lives, in our Christian living. You know, I am a shepherd by calling. I feed the flock, and I feed the flock with the word of God, and the word of God strengthens you. It guides you. It feeds you. It satisfies your soul. But you also have that same ministry. To whoever you can influence, family members, neighbors, co-workers, anybody that you think the Lord is leading you to talk to, you have that same ministry. As you learn the scriptures and you receive these timeless principles from the word of God here, you can give 
As long as you've received, lived, learned, loved, you can now, now you give out. That's the authoritative principles of the Word of God, put into practice and taught to others. You know, we can disciple people and bring them along the way of truth. That's what we've been doing in our Sunday school hour. You've been learning the fundamentals of the faith is what you've been learning. And the fundamentals of the faith is not just so you can sit and soak in it, but so you can teach it, so you can live it out and give it so others may learn it, learn from it. So fundamental number one, authoritative uh, authoritative teaching from the Word of God. Number two, confront evil. The only thing that you have to do to confront evil is live out the Scriptures. (laughs) You live it out, evil will come to you. It'll try to resist you. Confront the evil. We can't, again, cast out demons. You can't do the miraculous, but if you live out the Word of God, you speak out the Word of God into your life and into culture, there will be confrontation with evil. Thirdly, third fundamental, exercise compassion. You don't have to look far to cultivate a heart of compassion within our own congregation. Throughout the community here, there is ways that you can... I'm sorry, I can't turn this thing off. Excuse me for a second. It's not, it's not showing up like normal. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, no, I got it. I got it. I'm sorry. Here you go. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. You know the, uh, the, um, the thing that says cancel? It does, it's not showing up. Okay. There. Power off works just as well. Okay. All right. That should be the last. I apologize for that. All right. So again, fundamentals of Christian ministry. Authoritative word. Confront evil. Exercise compassion. You know, it... There's plenty of ways you can exercise compassion here, okay? Visiting shut-ins, um, visiting people in hospitals. There's plenty of ways where, you know, you, you, you treat people as individuals, meet their needs, bring a meal, send a card, praying for you, many different ways. There are organizations around us as well that you can get involved in where you can let your light shine. Okay? You let the love of Christ come through you. Fourth fundamental is take time to renew your strength. Because you're human, find a regular place of solitude so you can be alone with God. You know, if you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. Getting alone with God is not selfish. It is, it's not a luxury. Getting alone with God is an essential. In fact, it is Christ-like. Because that's what Jesus did. He got away from the people that he might be with God. And then lastly, the fundamental. Pray that the kingdom of God would come. Especially in your heart. His dynamic rule. What he says you do. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And as you do that, everything else, God adds to your life. Things that will satisfy your soul. Not your needs, or not your greeds, but your needs. Are you exercising the fundamentals of the faith? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you with thanksgiving. Thank you for the example of Jesus himself. that that through the fundamentals of Christian ministry, we obey your will. Through the fundamentals of Christian ministry, we bring people into the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord, to know the word enough to live it and to teach it. Help us, Lord, to exercise compassion. Help us, Lord, to preach the kingdom and help us to continually renew our strength by
by sitting at your feet. Help us throughout this Christmas season to be vocal and courageous with our faith. But not just the words of our mouth, but with the help and the mercy of our hands. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. If you are here today, and I'm speaking to the congregation now, if you are here today and you say, Pastor, I need a helping hand. I need you to pray for me. I need a hand of mercy. Raise your hand. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I need help. Heavenly Father, help us to learn to help, to open our eyes to see the need, and then open up our hands to help, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please stand with me. We're going to sing the doxology. Pastor Bryce is going to come. Don't forget tonight, bring an umbrella if you're going to go uh, um, uh, caroling with us. And um, then a practice on Wednesday for the cantata. Practice Wednesday night for the cantata for those of you practicing. about five minutes for members.